Book One, Chapter One, Part One of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B. G. Oxford. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One, by Henry Charles Lee. Book One, Origin and Establishment. Chapter One, The Castilian Monarchy, Part One. It were difficult to exaggerate the disorder pervading the Castilian kingdoms when the Spanish monarchy found its origin in the union of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. Many causes had contributed to prolong and intensify the evils of the feudal system and to neutralize such advantages as it possessed. The struggles of the reconquest from the Saracen continued at intervals through seven hundred years and varied by constant civil broils, had bred a race of fierce and turbulent nobles, as eager to attack a neighbor or their sovereign as the Moor. The contemptuous manner in which the Cid is represented in the earliest ballads as treating his king shows what was, in the twelfth century, the feeling of the chivalry of Castile toward its overlord and a chronicler of the period seems rather to glory in the fact that it was always in rebellion against the royal power. So fragile was the feudal bond that a rico ome, or noble, could at any moment renounce allegiance by a simple message sent to the king through an hidalgo. The necessity of attracting population and organizing conquered frontiers, which subsequently became inland, led to granting improvidently liberal franchises to settlers, which weakened the powers of the crown, without building up, as in France, a powerful third estate to serve as a counterpoise to the nobles and eventually to undermine feudalism. In Spain the business of the Castilian was war. The arts of peace were left with disdain to the Jews and the conquered Muslims, known as Mudejares who were allowed to remain on Christian soil and to form a distinct element in the population. No flourishing centers of industrious and independent burghers arose out of whom the kings could mold a body that should lend them efficient support in their struggles with their powerful vassals. The attempt indeed was made. The Cortes, whose cooperation was required in the enactment of laws, consisted of representatives from seventeen cities who while serving enjoyed personal inviolability but so little did the cities prize this privilege that under henry the fourth they complained of the expense of sending deputies the crown eager to find some new sources of influence agreed to pay them and thus obtained an excuse for controlling their election and although this came too late for henry to benefit by it, it paved the way for the assumption of absolute domination by Ferdinand and Isabella, after which the revolt of the Comunidades proved fruitless. Meanwhile, their influence diminished, their meetings were scantily attended, and they became little more than an instrument which, in the interminable strife that cursed the land, was used alternately by any faction as opportunity offered. The crown itself had contributed greatly to its own abasement. When, in the 13th century, a ruler such as San Fernando III made the laws respected and vigorously extended the boundaries of Christianity, Castile gave promise of development in power and culture, which miserably failed in the performance. In 1282, the rebellion of Sancho el Bravo against his father Alfonso was the commencement of decadence. To purchase the allegiance of the nobles he granted them all that they asked, and to avert the discontent consequent on taxation he supplied his treasury by alienating the crown lands. Notwithstanding the abilities of the regent, Maria de Molina, the successive minorities of her son and grandson, Fernando IV and Alfonso XI, stimulated the downward progress 
although the vigor of the latter in his maturity restored in some degree the luster of the crown and his stern justice re-established order so that as we are told property could be left unguarded in the streets at night his son don pedro earned the epithet of the cruel by his ruthless endeavor to reduce to obedience his turbulent nobles whose disaffection invited the usurpation of his bastard brother henry of trastamara the throne which the latter won by fratricide and the aid of the foreigner he could only hold by fresh concessions to his magnates which fatally reduced the royal power this heritage he left to his son juan i who forcibly described in the cortes of valladolid in thirteen eighty five how he wore mourning in his heart because of his powerlessness to administer justice and to govern as he ought in consequence of the evil customs which he was unable to correct this depicts the condition of the monarchy during the century intervening between the murder of pedro and the accession of isabella a dreary period of endless revolt and civil strife during which the central authority was steadily growing less able to curb the lawless elements tending to eventual anarchy the king was little more than a puppet of which rival factions sought to gain possession in order to cover their ambitions with a cloak of legality and those which failed to secure his person treated his authority with contempt or set up some rival in a son or brother as an excuse for rebellion the work of the reconquest which for six hundred years had been the leading object of national pride was virtually abandoned save in some spasmodic enterprise such as the capture of antiquera and the little kingdom of granada apparently on the point of extinction under alfonso the eleventh seemed destined to perpetuate forever on spanish soil the hateful presence of the crescent the long reign of the feeble juan the second from fourteen o six to fourteen fifty four was followed by that of the feebler henry the fourth popularly known as el impotente in the seguro de tordesillas in fourteen thirty nine the disaffected nobles virtually dictated terms to juan the second in the disposition of avila in fourteen sixty five they treated henry the fourth with the bitterest contempt his effigy clad in mourning and adorned with the royal insignia was placed upon a throne and four articles of accusation were read for the first he was pronounced unworthy of the kingly station when alonso carillo archbishop of toledo removed the crown for the second he was deprived of the administration of justice when alvara de zuniega count of placencia took away the sword for the third he was deprived of the government when rodrigo pimentel count of benavente struck the sceptre away for the fourth he was sentenced to lose the throne when diego lopez de zuniega tumbled the image from its seat with an indecent gibe it was scarce more than a continuation of the mockery when they elected as his successor his brother alfonso a child of eleven years of age the lawless independence of the nobles and the effacement of royal authority may be estimated from a single example at placencia two powerful lords garci alvarez de toledo senor of oropesa and hernan rodriguez de monroy kept the country in an uproar with their armed dissension juan the second sent ayala senor of cebola with a royal commission to suppress the disorder monroy in place of submitting insulted ayala who as a buen caballero disdained to complain to the king and preferred to avenge himself juan on hearing of this summoned to his presence monroy who collected all his friends and retainers and set out with a formidable army ayala made a similar levy and set upon him as he passed near cebola there was a desperate battle in which ayala was worsted and forced to take refuge in cebola while monroy passed on to toledo and when he kissed the king's hands juan told him that he had sent for him to cut off his head but as ayala had preferred to right himself he gave monroy a godspeed on his journey home 
and washed his hands of the whole affair. The rico homes, who thus were released from all the restraint of law, had as little respect for those of honor and morality. The virtues which we are wont to ascribe to chivalry were represented by such follies as the celebrated Paso Honroso of Suero de Quiñones, when that knight and his nine comrades, in 1434, kept, in honor of their ladies, for thirty days against all comers, the pass of the bridge of Orbigo, at the season of the Feast of Santiago, and sixty-nine challengers presented themselves in the lists. With exceptions such as this, and a rare manifestation of magnanimity, as when the Duke of Medina Sidonia raised an army and hastened to the relief of his enemy, Rodrigo Ponce de Leon besieged in Alhama. The record of this time is one of the foulest treachery, from which truth and honor are absent, and human nature displays itself in its basest aspect. According to contemporary belief, Ferdinand was indebted for the crown of Aragon to the poisoning of his brother, the deeply mourned Carlos, Prince of Viana, while the crown of Castile fell to Isabella through the similar taking off of her brother Alfonso. A characteristic incident is one involving Doña Maria de Monroy, who married into the great house of Enriquez of Seville, and was left a widow with two boys. When the youths were respectively eighteen and nineteen years old, they were close friends of two gentlemen of Seville named Manzano. The younger brother, dicing with them in their house, was involved in a quarrel with them, when they set upon him with their servants and slew him. Then, fearing the vengeance of the elder brother, they sent him a friendly message to come and play with them. When he came, they led him along a dark corridor, in which they suddenly turned upon him and stabbed him to death. When the disfigured corpses of her boys were brought to Doña Maria, she shed no tears, but the fierceness of her eyes frightened all who looked upon her. The Manzanos promptly took horse and fled to Portugal, whither Doña Maria followed them in male attire with a band of twenty cavaliers. Her spies were speedily on the track of the fugitives. Within a month of the murders, she came at night to the house where they lay concealed. The doors were broken in, and she entered with ten of her men, while the rest kept guard outside. The Manzanos put themselves in defense and shouted for help, but before the neighbors could assemble, she had both their heads in her left hand and was galloping off with her troop, never stopping till she reached Salamanca where she went to the church and laid the bloody heads on the tomb of her boys. Thenceforth she was known as Doña Maria la Brava, and her exploit led to long and murderous feuds between the Monroyes and the Manzanos. Doña Maria was but a type of the unsexed woman, mujeres varoniles, common at the time, who would take the field or maintain their place in factious intrigue with as much ferocity and pertinacity as men. Ferdinand could well look, without surprise, on the activity in court and camp of his Queen Isabella, when he remembered the prowess of his mother, Juana Enriquez, who had secured for him the crown of Aragon. Doña Leonora Pimentel, Duchess of Arevalo, was one of these. Of the Countess Medellin, it was said that no Roman captain could get the better of her in feats of arms, and the Countess of Haro was equally noted. The Countess of Medellin, indeed, kept her own son in prison for years while she enjoyed the revenues of his town of Medellin, and when Queen Isabella refused to confirm her possession of the place, she transferred her allegiance to the King of Portugal, to whom she delivered the castle of Merida. At the same time, the Moorish influence, which was so strong in Castile, occasionally led to the opposite extreme. The Duke of Najera kept his daughters in such absolute seclusion that no man, not even his sons, was permitted to enter the apartments reserved for the women, and the reason he alleged that the heart does not covet what the eye does not see was little flattering to either sex. The condition of the common people can readily be imagined in this perpetual strife between warlike, ambitious, and unprincipled nobles, now uniting in factions which involved the whole realm in war, 
and now contenting themselves with assaults upon their neighbors. The land was desolated. The husbandman scarce could take heart to plant his seed, for the harvest was apt to be garnered with the sword and thrust into castles to provision them against siege. As a writer of the period tells us, there was neither law nor justice save that of arms. In a letter describing the universal anarchy written by Hernando del Pulgar from Madrid in 1473, he says that for more than five years there has been no communication from Murcia, where the family of Fajardo reigns supreme. It is, he says, as foreign a land as Navarre. That the roads were unsafe for trade or travel was a matter of course. Every petty Hidalgo converted his stronghold into a den of robbers, and what these left was swept away by bands of free companions. Disorder reigned supreme and all-pervading. The crown was powerless and the royal treasury exhausted. Improvident grants of lands and revenues and jurisdictions to bribe the treacherous fidelity of faithless nobles or to gratify worthless favorites were made till there was nothing left to give and then Henry the Fourth bestowed licenses for private mints until there were a hundred and fifty of them at work, flooding the land with base money, to the unutterable confusion of the coinage and the impoverishment of the people. The Cortes of Madrid in 1467 and of Osana in 1469 called on Henry to resume his improvident grants, and those of Madrigal, in 1476, repeated the urgency to Ferdinand and Isabella, who had been forced to follow his example. To this the sovereigns replied, thanking the Cortes and postponing the matter. They did not feel themselves strong enough until 1480, when at the Cortes of Toledo they resumed 30 million maravedis of revenue, which had been alienated during the Troubles, and this after an investigation which left untouched the gifts to loyal subjects, and only withdrew such as had been extorted. Respect for the crown had fallen as low as its revenues. The story told of the Count of Benevente shows how difficult it was, even after the accession of Isabella, for the nobles to recognize that they owed any obedience to the sovereign. He was walking with the queen when a woman came weeping and begging justice, saying that he had had her husband slain in spite of a royal safe conduct. She showed the letter which her husband had carried in his breast, pierced by the blow which had ended his life, when the count jeeringly remarked, A cuirass would have been of more service. Piqued by this, Isabella said, Count, do you then not wish there was no king in Castile? Rather, he said, I wish there were many. And why? Because then I should be one of them. In such a chaos of lawless passion, it is not to be supposed that the church was better than the nobles, who filled its high places with worthless scions of their stocks, or than the lower classes of the laity, who sought it in provision for a life of idleness and license. The primate of Castile was the archbishop of Toledo, who was likewise ex officio chancellor of the realm, and whose revenues were variously estimated at from eighty to a hundred thousand ducats, with patronage at his disposal amounting to a hundred thousand more. The occupant of this exalted position, at the accession of Isabella, was Alonso Carillo, a turbulent prelate, delighting in war, foremost in all the civil broils of the period, who, not content with the immense income of his see, lavished extravagant sums in alchemy. Hernando de Pulgar, in a letter of remonstrance, said to him, The people look to you as their bishop, and find in you their enemy. They groan and complain that you use your authority not for their benefit and reformation, but for their destruction, not as an exemplar of kindness and peace, but for corruption, scandal, and disturbance. When, in 1495, the Puritan Jimenez was appointed to the archbishopric. One of his first acts is said to have been the removal, from near the altar of the Franciscan Church of Toledo, of a magnificent tomb which Carrillo had erected to his bastard, Troilo Carrillo. 
His successor in the See of Toledo has a special interest for us in view of his labors to purify the faith which culminated in establishing the Inquisition. Pero González de Mendoza was one of the notable men of the day, whose influence with Ferdinand and Isabella won for him the name of the Third King. While yet a child, he held the curacy of Gita. At twelve, he had the archdeaconry of Guadalajara, one of the richest benefices in Spain, which he retained during the successive bishoprics of Calahora and Seguenza, and the archbishopric of Seville. The see of Seguenza he kept during the whole tenure successively of the archepiscopates of Seville and Toledo, in addition to which he was a cardinal and titular patriarch of Alexandria. With his kindred of the powerful house of Mendoza, he adhered to Henry the Fourth until they effected the sale of the hapless Beltraneja, who was in their hands to her father Henry for certain estates and the title of Duke del Infantado for Diego Hurtado, the head of the family, after which Pero González and his kinsmen promptly transferred their allegiance to Isabella. His admiring biographer assures us that he was more ready with his hands than with his tongue, that he was a gallant knight and that there was never a war in Spain during his time in which he did not personally take part, or at least have his troops engaged. Though he had no leisure to attend to his spiritual duties, he found time to yield to the temptations of the flesh. When, in 1484, he led the army of invasion to Granada, he took with him his bastard, Rodrigo de Mendoza, a youth of twenty, who was already Señor del Castil del Cid, and who, in 1492, was created Marquis of Senente on the occasion of his marriage, amid great rejoicings in the presence of Ferdinand and Isabella, to Leonor de Cerda, daughter and heiress of the Duke of Medina Sely, and niece of Ferdinand himself. This was not the only evidence of his frailty, of which he took no shame, for he had another son named Juan, by a lady of Valladolid, who was married to Doña Ana de Aragon, another niece of Ferdinand. With such men at the head of the church, it is not to be expected that the lower orders of the clergy should be models of decency and morality, rendering Christianity attractive to Jew and Moslem. Alonso Carillo, the Archbishop of Toledo, can scarce be regarded as a strict disciplinarian, but even he felt obliged when holding the council of aranda in 1473 to endeavor to repress the more flagrant scandals of the clergy as a corrective of their prevailing ignorance it was ordered that in the future none should be ordained who could not speak latin the language of the ritual and the foundation of all instruction theological and otherwise they were forbidden to wear silk or gaily colored garments as their licentiousness rendered them contemptible to the people, they were commanded to part with their concubines within two months. As their fondness for dicing led to perjuries, scandals, and homicides, they were required thereafter to abstain from it, privately as well as publicly. As many priests disdained to celebrate Mass, they were ordered to do so at least four times a year. Bishops, moreover, were urged to celebrate at least thrice a year under pain of severe penalties to be determined at the next council. The absurdities poured forth in their sermons by wandering priests and friars were to be repressed by requiring examinations prior to issuing licenses to preach, and the scandals of the pardon sellers were to be diminished by subjecting them to the bishops. The bishops were also urged to make severe examples of offenders in the lower orders of the clergy when delivered to them by the secular courts, and not to allow their enormities to enjoy continued immunity. The bishops, moreover, were commanded to make no charge for the conferring of ordinations. They were exhorted, and all other clerics were required, not to lead a dissolute military life, or to enter the service of secular lords excepting of the king and princes of the blood. All duels were forbidden. Both laity and clergy were warned that if slain in such encounters they would be refused Christian burial, that this effort at reform was, as might be expected, wholly abortive, is evidenced from the description of the vices of the ecclesiastical body when Ferdinand and Isabella subsequently endeavored to correct its more flagrant scandals. 
It was wholly secularized, and only to be distinguished from the laity by the sacred functions which rendered its vices more abhorrent, by the immunities which fostered and stimulated those vices, and by the intolerance which, blind to all aberrations of morals, proclaimed the stake to be the only fitting punishment for aberration in faith. While powerless to reform itself, it yet had influence enough to educate the people up to its standard of orthodoxy in the ruthless persecution of all whom it pleased to designate as enemies of Christ. End of Book One, Chapter One, Part One Recording by B. G. Oxford December 2008